Hi, I'm Rita Hill. I've been a journalist for most of my life, although the tools I use now in my own work at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism are less likely to be a pen and a reporter's notebook and more likely to be VR or AR goggles. I spent the bulk of my career at the Washington Post as a reporter before launching the website in 1996. Then I became vice president for BET Interactive, where I launched that website. In 2007, I came to ASU to start the New Media Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab. And one of the things I really enjoy is working with boundary pushing, innovative students and colleagues at various departments around ASU, including here at the Center for Education Through Exploration. I was asked today to talk to you about the importance of place in storytelling. As a journalist, one of the first lessons you learn when it comes to writing is the importance of the five W's and the one H, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. We use it to tell pretty simple stories. It's a formula, but it helps us to remember never leave the scene of a story without answering those vital questions. That formula helps us uh, with simple stories and complex stories. A simple story like reporting on a man who was killed while in an intersection, for example. We tell the who, that he was a 45-year-old man, what was killed, when, Tuesday night, where, at the Main and Elm intersection near the courthouse, why, when he ran into the street, and how he was struck by a delivery truck. We know we have to each all of those to answer each of uh, answer each of those questions, or they'll be heck to pay by a grumpy old editor back at the city desk. As the story goes on, we fill in the details. We tell a little bit more about the who, the man's name, where he worked, if he was married or a father. The what might add more of the particulars, and the why and the how are the crux answering for all of his neighbors the burning question of how it came to pass that a 45-year-old man was killed. 45-year-old men are not supposed to die, at least not that way. The where, the place, the room where it happens, at, as Hamilton and John Bolton has reminded us in recent days, it usually doesn't take center stage until it's in the hands of more skilled writers, or sometimes in the hands of hacks who take six, seven paragraphs to set up a scene. However, the where, the place in a documentary and especially a 360 video such as a virtual field trip is probably the most important thing. At least it's in, as is important as the what. Place, you see, should never be something that you rush through on your way to the who, the when, or even the why and the how. In 360 video and virtual field trips, the where is almost everything you have to draw the watcher in, to get her to pay attention and to listen to all that comes along with it. To explore this a little bit more, I wanted to talk about a master storyteller who elevated the where to an exalted position next to the what, Anthony Bourdain. Anthony Bourdain, that late great troubled chef and wanderer, was a genius when it came to this for his show, CNN, Parts Unknown. Notice he tells you in the title of the show what he's doing, focusing in on the parts, the places, on the places that perhaps we thought we knew but didn't, or the places that we chose not to know because of our own misconceptions. What Borden did was to treat the place as the central character of his 60-minute documentaries. And I bet you thought the food was the star. Of course it was, but it was the place that begat the people who made the food that made us want to come along with Anthony each season. His documentary on the Mississippi Delta is a case in point. Bourdain usually came up with a theme around a place um, he tried to come up with a question that he wanted to answer. In Mississippi, what I heard and saw in that show was the push-pull of the Delta's horrifying past of racial intolerance and brutality, but also the thick ties of the people to each other and to the state that made Mississippi a place like no other in the United States or even in the world. Anthony talked about the ghost of Mississippi's past, 
a past so terrible that made, it made him wonder why of all the places in the world that he traveled to, including Iran and Saudi Arabia and South Africa, he asked, why can't I love Mississippi? And that's what he set out to do, to see if he could try. And that's how he framed the piece. So he took us on a canoe ride with one of his guests in the early morning mist on the Mississippi to catch the fish that would later, later become a breakfast for a bunch of African-American city kids so they could taste what sustained their forefathers. And that's why he took us to Oxford, Mississippi, where younger white foodies who looked like they'd be more at home in Portland than in Mississippi had come back there to challenge the notion of what people thought about Mississippi and what they thought about the food. And that's why he most famously took us to Poe Monkey's Juke Joint. The image of a shack in the woods where people were liquored up and folks like Bad Bad Leroy Brown would cut you as soon as look at you is what people typically think of when you think of a, a juke joint. So at Poe Monkey's, Bourdain's camera squeezed into the tight spaces of that juke joint. It was nestled in the back of a cornfield, but it was one of the few remaining spots on the old blues trail the blues trail that birthed rock and roll and R&B. Family night at Poe Monkeys, Bourdain told us, is mostly locals, a mixed bag. The music is R&B and pre-disco soul. The attitude, loose. Just familiarize yourself with those rules and there won't be any problem. Oh man, that line and looking at the people gathered there heads bobbing to some old blues band, hand dancing. That place, it made me someone who's always fiercely feared Mississippi want to go there and get a little bit of that place. Anthony talked about in that place, the complexity, the contradiction, and the unexpectedness that lurk around every corner in Mississippi. That was masterful. It was a master storyteller making you challenge your assumptions about a place that perhaps you thought you knew. So you might ask yourself, I'm no Anthony Bourdain or my students aren't, what can students do? A lot. Back in uh, 2019, Thomas Roberto, one of the PhD students here in this program and I did a, a project on the community of Garfield. Garfield is located just north of the ASU downtown campus. In about 10 days, 20 or so high school students created a window onto Garfield that the locals are still talking about. We created a podcast, an animated motion book, a video game about the change based on all that was happening, but also guided the complexity of what was going on. And we also created a high res virtual reality field trip that captured the change that was engulfing the community right then and there. But like Bourdain, we didn't just jump into it. We set out to know the place. We walked the streets, talked to the longtime residents and the recently arrived. We met the quirky people who lived there and talked to the trendy. We admired the various housing styles from the old four squares to the bungalows to the modern alt dwellings. Those buildings marked in brick and stone and wood and stucco the city's evolution from a dusty old western town to the nation's fifth largest city. Garfield, you see, was Phoenix's first suburb. It got that way because enterprising residents themselves put in an extension to the city streetcar line so people wouldn't be afraid or reluctant to buy a plot of land so far out of town. That was in the 1880s and it worked. The fashionable and the well-connected moved to Garfield, which was located, of course, just outside the city line. That theme, the theme that emerged for us was Garfield's historic willingness to make its own destiny. And today, newbies moving into the relatively affordable, beautiful historic homes or renovating reclaimed commercial buildings find out pretty quickly that if you understand that simple rule in that history, there won't be any problems. For students who might be doing a virtual field trip on their own neighborhoods, 
Here are a few tips. Just respect the place. Do your research on the neighborhood's origins. Seek out the old timers who can tell you how things like really happen, who can tell you about those little gems that might take you years otherwise to discover on your own. Talk to the historical society and the leaders at various churches and temples and recreation centers to find out how it really happened. Go out and soak it all in and then tell it not how you thought it was, but simply how it came to be. Look at it with your own fresh eyes. And most of all, just honor the place for what it is, for all its beauty and all its warts. Just honor it. Tell the truth. And if you do that one simple thing, there won't be any problems. Thank you for listening to me, and I'll be more than happy to answer any questions in the live session. Thank you.